on male fertility. I do not call it infertility for the prime reason that infertility turns out to be a kind of a negative emotion. In fact, I call all my patients fertility champions. I never call them infertility patients. And the moment I say fertility champions, you know what happens? These people feel so happy. And that's the way it's meant to be. I am Dr. Sunil Jinder, a father of three lovely children, have an amazing wife. I am a surgeon and urologist by training. I am an andrologist and ART specialist by passion. I love to teach, work, sing and write. And I'm here before you yours truly to start today's program on male fertility. Uh, I had for a very long time been thinking that what kind of a program should we have? And I actually thought that a program should be such in which the value added to the program could translate into the practical value for patients. And in turn, this practical value should change into the reality of they having a baby. Because that adds value to them, that adds value to us, and that also economically is important. Uh, there's a very beautiful story, a very beautiful story of uh, Michael Jordan. If you have heard about Michael Jordan when he was young. Michael Jordan, I'm sure all of you know who he was. Who was Michael Jordan? Who was Michael Jordan? Please type it into your chat box. Who was Michael Jordan? Basketball player? Right. The greatest basketball player ever. And do we know that Michael Jordan was from a very, very, very poor black neighborhood. So one day his father said to him that why don't you go? and sell a t-shirt. So Michael Jordan's father gave him his old t-shirt and said, why don't you sell this t-shirt for $2? The cost of a new t-shirt was $1. You have an old t-shirt, sell it for $2. Michael Jordan cleaned the t-shirt. There was no iron with him. He just folded and between wooden planks made it straight. Went to the subway and he stood for about six hours, six hours to sell that t-shirt. When he came back, came to his father, gave him the two dollars and said, I have sold it. The father smiled and said, I'm giving you another t-shirt. Sell it for twenty dollars. And Michael Jordan took that t-shirt, got a cousin of his, who could paint well, asked him to paint Mickey Mouse on that t-shirt. He took that t-shirt to the most expensive school of the area, stood outside it at the time when the parents used to come to get their children. One lady saw that t-shirt, she liked it. Then her son came in. So instead of $20, which he asked for, the woman gave him $25. So he came back home, told his father, I have got $25. Father took the $25. Father used to earn $25 in a month. He said, I'm giving you something else, another t-shirt. Sell it for $200. This is a true story, by the way. So he took the t-shirt and kept on thinking all night what he would do. He waited for about 10 days. There was a Broadway show of, if you've heard, Charlie's Angels. And in this Broadway show, when he went there, he somehow sneaked in between the legs of people and went inside the show wearing the t-shirt with a pen and there was Farah Fawcett. And he went to Farah Fawcett and said, can you give me an autograph, please? She signed. He came out, took out the t-shirt, 
auctioned it for $250 and came back with $250, gave them to the father. Now, what's the moral of the story and how does it connect with us? Can you please type in what is the story of this in the chat box? Please bring it on, B-I-O. Just type it in. What is the moral of the story? I would really like to see what you think about it because it concerns us as well. And the value addition is the moral. Till we add value within ourselves, we cannot add value to other people. And this is the reason that I believe that till you add value into your own medical knowledge, profession, its application, you just cannot add value to the people in front of you. And this is such a beautiful story on which I will begin now. And I'm going to give you the tips of books to bedside. Why? Because there's so many books which we have read, but how to use those books on the bedside. So I'd like to begin the presentation now. This, of course, is yours truly. I would like to ask the organizers, I would like the screen such, 50% slide and 50% me. Not the small boxes, but 50-50, please. If you could do it, please. Great. So, do we know that the extent of the contribution of the man is 50%? The extent is 50% because according to a very simple calculation, if there are 100 people who don't have children, 30% the cause is man, 30% the cause is woman, 40% the cause is both. So the combined percentage is about 50%. And in any fertility center, the person who's looked into or looked after is normally the woman. Now, what are the basic things if we look at it? Very simply, I've tried to make this presentation as simple and practical as possible. There are thousands of papers which I can quote to you, but I'll not be quoting any. I'll just be giving you the gist of these papers. See, sperm dysfunction, azoospermia, ineffective coitus, contribute to about 50%. Thus, andrology is the core of reproductive medicine. Fortunately, unfortunately, it still remains an enigma for so many. Now, very simply, there is the problem. So the problem could be in the hormones in the brain. The problem could be in the testes. The problem could be in the tubes, which means the best. Or the man could be important. I get so many patients today after five years of marriage, four years of marriage, do not have a child. They come for a child and they have never had intercourse. So the most important thing for us to understand is that the first important step is history and physical examination. The most important thing is history and physical examination. Now, a lot of people over here are gynecologists who do not find it comfortable to examine a male, in that condition, you should have somebody to examine the patient. Because I'll just continue further. Ultrasound is not a replacement for examination. And every man should be examined. You need to get two semen samples, not one. There have to be additional lab testings after the semen analysis for us to know what is the direction in which we need to go? And then you need to decide whether you would like to give a medical treatment, a surgical treatment, or an ART treatment. Or you'd like to combine all of them. So the beauty about andrology is 
that it needs the combination of the person looking after the female partner and the person looking after the female partner needs the male to be looked after equally so please understand this is of prime importance now the next thing is semen analysis 90% of semen analysis done today at all the places is incorrect the most important investigation for a male is semen analysis and this should be done properly if this is not done properly you are going to have issues why it should be done by who criteria the morphology should be by kubus criteria and in case a culture is done it should be done by the proper culture techniques now the other question which comes to us is that what should be the gap of the two semen analysis ideally it should be 3 months because the cycle is such that it takes about 3 months for the fresh production of sperms but it could be a situation where if there is a semen semen defect within a few weeks we would want the second analysis in case a culture is needed that becomes very important and it should be done properly now let us come on to the who criteria the who criteria today is a volume of 1.5 a sperm count of 15 million count per ejaculate 39 million total motility 40% normal 4% or the question is you would say there used to be a time when the normal morphology we used to think was around 20 to 40% now that it is 4 what to do why is it so please understand it's not because of any other reason but because the morphology seeing criteria has become strict so what used to be 40 normal once upon a time in that by strict criteria you normally find only 4% normal but this needs to be used i'll tell you further on why now the semen parameters have changed 2010 we got a different criteria three things are most important the volume the motility and the morphology now what is the problem with the who reference value so the first important thing is it has not been done in the asian continent and because it has not been done in asia it does not represent particularly us so that's a very important criteria for us to understand number 2 the female was never taken into consideration and what they saw was who are the number of people who have their partner pregnant within one year and these were taken as the percentile and 5% was put as the cut off so there is also a lot of issues with the system but what we need to understand is <coughs> in case you need to get a semen done it should be done by who criteria morphology should be strict to us and it has to be accurate because it is the single most important investigation of the male now you come to a semen analysis so you have a patient who has come to you with a semen analysis and the volume is 0.3 and you test for fructose and the fructose is absent what can be the scenario in this i normally take a lot of case presentations and difficult case scenarios but over here it is not that i would just like to share with you the way i particularly would think about it so the most important thing would be vas aplasia there could be an ejaculatory duct obstruction there could be chronic seminal vesicularis and fibrosis they could be hypoplastic seminal vesicles partially retrograde would have some fractures and urethral pouch or stricture will have some fractures so what i mean to say is at this moment 
that please investigate the patient for an ejaculatory duct obstruction if there is a low volume and absent fractures. So in case you get a semen analysis where you have impaired motility, what will you do? In case there is impaired motility, you would consider it to be either associated with oligosus pump, it could be idiopathic, there could be infection, there could be antibodies present. These things have to be kept into consideration in case the motility is low. Now you get a semen sample and the semen sample is giving a report of agglutination. Why should there be agglutination? Agglutination could be because of infection. So you have to see if there are any pus cells. You have to culture. There could be antibodies present or it can be idiopathic too. Now, if there is altered liquefaction or viscosity, it's very, very thick viscous semen and it's not liquefied. What could it be? It could be a past or present infection or it can be idiopathic. See, we need to understand that infection is a very important thing for us to look into any patient who has low motility, viscosity, agglutination, or pus In case there is total asthenosuspermia, all sperms are immotile. See, all immotile sperms do not mean that they would not be viable sperms. So you have to check the viability. There's a very long lecture which I have on semen function tests in which I talk about how to do it. But in case these sperms are viable, but immotile, it could be some microtubular defects in this sperm tail, cartagenous syndrome. But if all of them are non-viable too, it is something which is known as necrosis problem. Please also understand. A collection error like urine with the semen can also lead to a similar picture. So that has to be ruled out too. Next we come to the count. It could be a low count. So the low count could be idiopathic, there could be a varicocin, there could be external gonadal toxic factors, there could be recent illnesses, a relative gonadotrophin deficiency, or there can be a partial obstruction. So most of the patients who come with a low sperm count are idiopathic in nature. We need to understand this. If there are a large number of abnormal sperms, there could be a toxin explosion. There could be some problem in the morphology checking by Kruger's criteria. You need to send the sample to a speciality lab to be sure that morphology is bad. Or there could be some intrinsic defect in this sperm production. Now I've made this small table for you to understand that in case there is abnormal morphology, stress, gonorotoxins, varicocele, idiopathic could be a reason. How many of you see a low sperm count, oligospermia? in your reports. Please type in I. Please type in I. Please type in I. Yes, please type in I. Which makes me understand that a lot of people get oligospermia. We need to understand that for oligospermia, the most common cause is idiopathic. But we need to, in these cases, rule out varicocin, toxin exposure, stress, and also infections. In case there is asthenospermia, which means the motility is low, please check for a varicocin, 
genital gland infection, and any idiopathic cause. Now, let's come to tests. See, there are a lot of tests which are available. I'll only talk to you about the particular tests. So, you need to get a semen fructose done if the volume is low, if you feel there is a ejaculatory duct obstruction. You need to get a peroxidase testing in case the pus cells are high to choose between the pus cells and the round or immature sperm cells. You need to do a semen culture if you are finding any kind of infections. In case there are immotile sperms, you may need to get done a viability test to see if there are any viable sperms. See, all immotile sperms may not be non-viable. So you cannot say that somebody who is lying down is dead. Have you seen a crocodile? Magarmash dekha apne? Jaisa magarmash leta hota hai na? Kai ba sperm zinda hota hai. But it is not moving. These sperms at times need a hypoosmotic swelling test. Apart from this, a few other tests which we need are specialized tests as the DNA fragmentation test, as the ROS testing, as the Y chromosome microdeletion, which are practical tests which I get done day in and day out. I'm only going to talk to you about things which are utilizable, usable, and would like to make your time worthwhile while you are here so that you could take some message, add value to yourself and to your patients. It will add value to everything else. Now, you can get your hormonal testing done. Now, what is the hormonal testing which you could get done? So, what you could get done as a hormonal testing is what? Hormonal testing is FSH and testosterone are the primary hormones to be tested. But in case you would like to test, you could also get an LH and the E2 drug. Why? Because if the FSH, LH and testosterone are down, what is the condition? Please type it in. Please type it in in the chat box. I would like to see your chat box. I'd like to see your chat box. All three low. FSH, LH, testosterone, all three low. What is it? What is it? Yes, it is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. In case you have a normal FSH, normal LH, normal testosterone, and a normal size testes with azospermia, the chances are that it may be Obstructive azospermia. And in case the FSH is high, the LH is high, and the testosterone is normal or low, with a small testes, it could be a... Please type it in. Please type it in. I want you to be with me because we are having a conversation, even if it's on the web. Non-obstructive azospermia. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Now, where do you need a sportal ultrasound? I repeat again. Sportal ultrasound is not a substitute for examination. You would use it when you want to look for other testicular lesions as a tumor. The patient is too obese. You want to confirm a varicose or you want to confirm and check cysts in the epididymis or any lesions in the testes. Uh, there used to be a test, there still is done, post coital test, a very useful test. It is useful because it tells us the effectiveness of coitus. Please get a PCT done. If sexual 
his function is suspected. There are a lot of people who do not talk about the sexual dysfunction. Patients don't come and tell it to you. Please get it done. Well, there are a lot of other tests which need to be done, which can be done. But I've told you, the basic tests which need to be done are the semen analysis, the hormonal analysis, the culture. You may need to get a transrectal ultrasound in case you feel ejaculatory duct obstruction is there. Ultrasound, where I have told you, a biopsy in a few things which I will tell you further. You may need to get a chromosomal study in case you suspect a genetic problem, which is a whole new lecture and a different lecture altogether. These things may need to be done. Now I would like to talk to you about the examination. So I was wanting to show you a few videos. Now what you do is when you examine, you examine the testes, you feel the epididymis, and you feel them in an entirety. I just wanted to show an ultrasound. That an ultrasound, you can see everything about the testes, but the only important thing which you cannot see in ex examination is the ecotexture. So in case you suspect that the patient has some kind of a swelling or some kind of a tumor, you please go ahead and do an ultrasound. If you feel the patient has varicose, you can confirm it by ultrasound. And of course, it is a very good adjuvant. Now, how do you examine the epididymis? The epididymis has a head, it has a body, it has a tail. So what you need to do is, as you can see, I'm just showing you in the ultrasound, you can see that this is the epididymal head. This is the body. And this is the tail. These need to be examined, especially in azospermic men, where you would like to see if the epididymis is full. And what is the full area? Because if it is full, and if you can see the full area, you would know where to do a pizza or a MISA from. Now next is, this was a patient of bilateral azospermia. You can see that the epididymis is full at the head and the testes appears to be normal in size. So in case the testes appears to be normal in size and the epididymis is full, this is an obstructive azospermia. Now this is how you feel the spermatic cord. You feel in the spermatic cord the vas. You would like to see if the vas is present or not. You would also like to see if there is any varicose. And you would like to see if there is any funiculitis. See, one thing which we need to see, my friends, is if there is any infection in terms of orchitis in the testes, epididymitis in the epididymis, Funiculitis in the core, or it could be in the skin even. So any kind of an infection whatsoever is detrimental. If you have infection on the gland spheres, well, it is going to give infection at the time of intercourse, and it would lead to infection in the semen too. So it is going to affect fertility. So this is what we need to really examine. Now, this is a patient who has a varicocele. So, varicocele is normally examined when you have the patient in a standing position. And in the standing position, you would like to examine the varicocele, like the patient to do a valsalva maneuver. And in this valsalva maneuver, you would like to see if there are any engorged veins. And in case they are there, you would diagnose them as a varicocele. This is how the varicocele ultrasound appears to be. You can see over here, they are all dilated veins. I had a lot of videos before this, before checking and before I came of uh, varicocele. beautiful videos, but they were very heavy. I could not run them in PowerPoint. It was creating a problem. So that is the reason I am at the moment.
at the moment, because of this reason, uh, at the moment I have just shown the stills. This is my son's computer, which I have borrowed from him, and I forgot to change my name. So now I am here. So my name is Sunil Jinder. Great. So I continue from here. So now, what is the medical treatment? All everybody wants to know what's the medical treatment because this medical treatment everybody needs to give. So, who all want to know? In a nutshell, everything about medical treatment. If you want to, please type in, bring it on, B-I-O. Just type in B-I-O, the medical treatment, because this is extremely useful for everybody and everybody would like to use it. So please type in, B-I-O, bring it on. Yes. So we need to understand that medical treatment, you could categorize into two areas. One is antibiotics and antioxidants, and the other is the hormones which need to be given. In a nutshell, I would like to explain to you whatever I could, though it needs about two hours of my lecture on medical treatment for everybody to understand. But in a nutshell, it is that you have some conventional therapies. These are for subclinical male genital tract infections. You have some therapies for endocrine disorders. You have some of them for ejaculatory disorders. So please understand, infection, endocrine disorder, ejaculatory disorder. And there are some new treatments which have come. It is for excessive oxidative stress and obesity-related male infertility. So I, would ha I don't have much time, you know, because I've been just given one hour by the system and half an hour for questions. In this one hour, I'd like to cover it. In case you would like any other particular lectures on a subject, different subjects, I could take them on later for you. So... One question which is always asked is, when do I use clomiphen citrate? When do I use an astrosol? Can I use them in idiopathic male infertility? It would take me half an hour to explain clomiphen. But in a nutshell, clomiphen is given at a place where normally clomiphen would be given will be given wherever the testosterone is low normal or low. Whenever we get a testosterone done in oligospermics, and if it comes as normal at the lower side of normal or lower, give these patients clomiphen. Where would you give an astrosol? You would give an astrosol in an obese man where the estrogen has increased or is high. Now, there is not much evidence of an empirical therapy for clomiphene, and definitely there is no evidence for empirical of an astrosol. But despite so many controlled trials, there is still a controversy. So, what the way I use it is I use it in patients who are oligospermic, where the testosterone level is low or low normal. Now, where would you use antibiotics? You would use antibiotics where you have pus cells which have been confirmed by which test? Which test? I have spoken about it. I want it in the comment box. I just want it in the chat box. Which test? Which test to differentiate between which test to differentiate between around immature cells and pus cells? Peroxidase test. So you confirm it with a peroxidase test. And in case there is infection, 
you give these patients antibiotics. You need to give these patients antibiotics for three to six weeks. You may need to give these patients some anti-inflammatories and you need to give these patients antioxidants. Why antioxidants? Yeah, I want it in the chat box. Why antioxidants? Right? Why antioxidants? Why would you like to have antioxidants? Why would you like to have antioxidants? You would like to have antioxidants because the ROS, because of pus cells and infection, goes up and there is higher DNA fragmentation. Now, in hypogonotrophic hypogonadism, the treatment is <clears throat> SCG and FSH or HMG. See, in hypogonotrophic hypogonadism, the LH and FS both are low. <coughs> you need to replace them. LH is replaced by SCG. And FSH can be replaced by HMG. So you need to give both of them so that the testes may start functioning and sperms may be there. We have a series of about 32 cases of hypogonotrophic hypogonadism. And if, if I tell you the story of the first case, well, it's about 14 years back. This very rich lady came to me and I've known her for a long time. And she said, there is somebody I know who does not have sperms. Where can I buy the most expensive sperm in the world? <clears throat> Please type in the most expensive sperm. Expensive sperm. Yes, expensive sperm. ES. Please type in ES. So she asked for the most expensive sperm. I asked her if there were any reports. And I saw the reports of small testes, low testosterone, minuscule FSH and LH. It was hypogonotrophic hypogonadism. So I told her that the most valuable sperm is his own sperm. Then she told me it's her son. And he was diagnosed as hypogonotrophic hypogonadism at a very young age. And she did nothing about it. He got married and he had no mustaches. He was very, very cute looking, looked like a woman, came to me. I started him on SCG and HMG. After about six weeks, not six weeks, sorry, about three and a half months, I got a call from my embryology lab. We have got sperms, we have got sperms. I said, wow. So we froze his sperms, continued it. He remained oligospermic. We did an ICSI. First cycle, she didn't conceive. Second cycle, she had quadruplets because we transferred four embryos, thinking that we didn't know what the embryos would be. Then we did a fetal reduction. And she gave rise to, and he gave rise to. I mean, they, they had two beautiful babies. And the interesting thing is, you know what? He still takes SCG does not take testosterone HCG because his whole persona, his mustaches, his beard, his physical capability, his muscles, his sexual systems have become gone. So the beauty is when you start treating your patients and they have children, it's priceless. And I mean it. That's the reason I want to share all this with you so that you could treat your patients too. Now, you could use SCG, HMG. Now, I would come to a place what is known as retrograde ejaculation. If there is retrograde ejaculation and there is no bladder neck abnormality, you can use ephedrine, pseudoephedrine and imipramine there may be a chance that you may get a semen. Otherwise, 
Some people suggest an IUI but the, from the urine, after taking off sperms from the urine, but the chances of having a baby are very low. Therefore, the answer ultimately is a sperm retrieval. Wow. Excessive oxidative stress. I've had a phenomenal, I would say, chance of having an interaction with Dr. Ashok Agarwal, who is a very close friend of mine in Cleveland Clinic. And the amount of work which he has done on oxidative stress is the number one in the world. Visiting his laboratories, staying with him, looking at the research the way he has done it. In fact, in one of the international papers where you have people from 42 countries in the world, I had the good fortune of uh, collaborating for a very large study. And the sperm functionality is not the sperm number. So if a man comes to you with 50 million sperms, it does not mean that all those sperms which are 50 million and motile are functional. Because if the DNA is bad and there is high oxidative stress, these sperms would not give a pregnancy. So we need to understand that environmental life factors, male accessory gland infections, stasis, immature abnormal spermatozoa, diabetes, smoking, all of these lead to oxidative stress. Now, I would like to know from you, what is the reason that sperm is so sensitive? Please type it in the chat box. Why is the sperm so sensitive? <laughs> Men are sensitive. But why is sperm sensitive is the most important thing. Yes. This is because there is very little cytoplasm in the sperm head. And because it is a nucleus only, this leads to a situation where the chances of DNA damage are very high because of oxidative stress. So this is something which I wanted to bring forth for you. The Cochrane Review today shows us that the live births, pregnancy rate, DNA fragmentation, miscarriage, all these things are better whenever you do uh, whenever you give these patients antioxidants. Now, what are the antioxidants which I use? I use vitamin C, vitamin E, folic acid, zinc, selenium, astaxanthin, coenzyme Q, lycopene, L-carnitine. In fact, I myself eat vitamin E and vitamin C daily. People say, what is the biggest protection against COVID-19? So nowadays, there's a homeopathic drug which has become very popular. I mean, people ask me about it. That's why I came to know. But the truth is that the best antioxidant, vitamin E and vitamin C, should be had by all of us, even otherwise. So that's a great thing to take. And you need to take it for around three to four months, a minimum of two months, of course. Obesity-related, I have spoken to you. When the TE ratio gets reversed, or less than 10 for that matter, you would give an astrazole to these people. Now let's come to the surgical treatment. See, I, by original design, am a surgeon. I was trained to do surgery throughout my life. I used to do laparoscopic gallbladders, hernias, appendices, nephrectomies. But the beauty about the whole thing is that one of my mentors, Dr. Rakesh Sena, he taught me laparoscopic gynecology. And because I loved surgery, my goodness, that was a new story. During my training, there was a whole andrology unit which was associated with us for six years. But I never used to be very much turned on by andrology because there was no blood in it. <laughs> but then, over a period of time, my realization very deep down is that you are on a journey of learning things every day and utilizing them. 
So today, there is so much of laboratory andrology. There is so much of surgical andrology. So I will talk to you about the surgical andrology which we do. See, we have to understand which are the procedures which are important. So one procedure which is very important is varicocele surgery. Contrary to what a lot of gynecologists believe, my wife's a gynecologist too, but she has seen so many of results post varicocele surgery that she knows very clearly that in case a microscopic varicocelectomy is done, well, it is not only good for the oligospermics, it improves the quality of the sperm. And this quality of the sperm is most important. So it needs to be done in selected cases. It needs to be done microscopically. And it needs to be done well. And patients need to be counseled very well before this. This is a whole new chapter which I could talk about varicocele surgery. Now, Vesu was asked to me, in case a person has come to you with a vas, or sorry, vasectomy, when would you do a vasectomy? Please type it in. When would you do a vasectomy? When would you do a vasectomy? We would do a vasectomy in case the partner has a reasonable age. If, your, if the partner is about 30, 35 years of age, she already would be having a low AMH. She would be having a poor egg formation. And normally these men would come to you when they have lost a child. So in these conditions, ART is the answer. Otherwise, a good vasectomy in a young person can be very useful. Because you could have quite a number of children and it doesn't, it's a single procedure. Now, let's come to azuspermia. Azuspermia is complete absence of sperms. 1 to 3% male population, 10 to percent causes of male infertility. Now, how many of you get azuspermics in your clinic? Please type in I. I. Let me see your typings. Because I'm going to share fantastic secrets with you. I will share the secrets you don't know about. Just type in I if you have azospermics in your clinic. Wow. So there's two types of azospermia. Obstructive and non-obstructive. Obstructive is when there is an obstruction and the testes is functioning normally. And non-obstructive is when the function of the testes is poor. So in obstructive, there is a normal sperm production. There is a mechanical blockage. It could be because of vasectomy, post-infectious or congenital. And non-obstructive is because the sperm production is deficient or absent. Now, there could be so many other reasons as varicocele, genetic trauma, gonadotoxins too. But something for us to understand is in obstructive azospermia, 95% of men can have their own children. And in non obstructive azospermia, 30 to 40% can have their own children. I always say one thing. Say no to third party reproduction. Say yes to your own gametes. It is more difficult. It is tougher. It needs a lot of hard work. It needs a lot of training. But then your baby is your baby. And that is the reason I would like to tell you a little bit about Azuspermia. 
So, in azoospermics, with fructose positive, you could have three areas. One could be obstructive, where the testis size is normal and the FSH and LH and prolactin testosterone could be normal. There could be testicular failure where the FSH is high and the testes is small, or it could be equivocal in between. So, what are the procedures we have? We have PISA, percutaneous aspiration. We could have MISA, where microscopically you open up the epididymis to take out the spots. There could be testicular aspiration, known as TISA. You would do it where PISA fails and it's obstructive as you Then there is TSA. TSA is done where PISA and TSA have failed in obstructive as or there is non obstructive as And then, of course, you have something which I love, micro TSA, which is done in non obstructive as You know what is the most satisfying thing which I personally feel to give children to? men who are cancer survivors. I've had a series of patients who are cancer survivors, had cancer during childhood, got cured of it, did not have children, had no semen which had been frozen. They have their own children. Kleinfelter syndrome, maturation arrest, hypospermatogenesis, all these people can have their own children. Now, the first thing which I'd like to tell you is about PISA. So, I want to show you videos for you to understand very clearly what it is. In a PISA, what we normally do is, we take the most prominent area of the epididymis. Use a tubercular syringe with a 21 gauge needle. This is not the correct thing which is written here. This is normally done, PISA, when you are not able to do it with a tuberculin syringe. Then you take a 21 gauge butterfly needle with a 10 ml syringe. But in the video, it is the other way. You can see the number of good sperms which you could get in an obstructive as sperm here. You could even freeze them for the next time. Now, a TISA is done with a 16 to 19 gauge butterfly needle and a 20 ml syringe. You take some media into the tubing. Once you have taken some media into the tubing, you will go into the testes. Your assistant is going to Do suction, you're going to break in a few tubules with the needle, pull it out, and take out if any tubules are present. This is TSA. Then comes <clears throat> TSA. Now, in case there is a patient who has hypospermatogenesis or obstructive azospermia, epididymis is not very good you'd like to do a testicular biopsy, then we do a testicular biopsy by a window technique in which we give a very small incision and take out sperms from a very small incision. Only a single stitch would be needed and a band-aid for the patient. And the patient, if we've done in local, can go after one hour he can go home. This was a patient who had undergone a lot of aspirations and the tunica was stuck. So there it is. You get a small sample and in case the embryologist tells you he's got sperms, bingo, job is done. So just a band-aid is needed. Now, <clears throat> if 
in a patient, you feel that you would need multiple biopsies in a patient of non-obstructive azoospermia. This was a patient who had been operated before and his tunica was very much adhered. He had a report of a hypospermatogenesis and he did not want to undergo a micro -TC. So in this, if multiple biopsies are given and in these multiple biopsies, you take out sperm from different areas, you would be in a position to use this sperm from these multiple biopsies to give a baby. So this could be from multiple incisions. Now there is something beautiful which I do is a needle mapping. So if you realize to open up the testes of the man, men are very sensitive about their testes. Oh yes. They will bring their wives 10 times to get an exceed huh? but they would not offer their testes even once. You know why? You know why? Because during childhood, they probably have been in school kicked once on the testes, which is extremely painful. And they feel that memory they don't want to live again. I asked a patient and I'm giving you what he said. So you would do a needle mapping. For a needle mapping, normally it's done under local anesthesia. You would mark multiple sites. You would do a needle mapping and in case sperms are found, you would needle map that area and if the sperms are not adequate, open it in that area. only. You can see over here, you have a testes. You would map 16 areas, put it into one, do a say and you have labeled it over here in 16 drops. In case you get it in one of the drops and the embryologist tells you and he wants more sperms, then you go into only that area of the testes and take out sperms. It's a very delicate procedure. Next, next is Tefna. Now I have taken out the testes. This patient had non-obstructive azoospermia. I planned for a micro TSA, but before a micro TSA, I decided to go ahead and do a TSA mapping or what I could call is a Tefna. So you put in a needle, you would pull out, give suction and the interesting thing which you would see now is when you pull out the needle, a tubule comes out, it's a continuous tubule, you pull out the tubule, pull out the tubule with the micro forceps and you get a beautiful size as a biopsy. So it's just a needle and you get a reasonable size of testicular tissue. Now if you take it out from 16 areas and if one of the areas has sperms, then you would enter this particular area to take out tissue for sperms. So now how do you do the job in the laboratory. We've been doing it now for about 16, 17 years. So we have formulated very different procedures, very different things for different kinds of sperms. For PISA, for TISA, for non-obstructive azoospermia, for immotile sperms, for poor quality sperms, there are different procedures. But one procedure which I'd like to show you is in a patient where we've had a testicular biopsy, we normally want to strip the tubules to take out the sperms. Now this stripping is done by two needles, a homogenate is formed and when you strip them open, sperms come out. And these are what you need. 
So this is what you see over here in the homogenate. Now you would see this as you can see over here. Now in this material, you need to look for sparks, which may take you an hour, which may take you two hours. In non-obstructive vasospermia, at times it takes us about two, two and a half hours to operate and two teams of our embryologists to work for two, two and a half hours at times for us to get four sperms if she has four eggs. But you know, once you get these four sperms, you get a fertilization, you get a pregnancy, you get a heartbeat, and you get a baby. It's worth it. And I believe me, it's really worth it. Now, micro TSA is done under general anesthesia. We use a magnification. I use a microscope normally between 10x and 20x magnification. The enlarged tubules are seen, and these enlarged tubules are taken out. At times, if you can't see it, enlarged tubules, you would take out tubules which look different. Strip them. Ask if sperms are there. And if sperms are there, use them. So as you can see over here, this is an area of enlarged tubules. So once you see them under a microscope, you're going to take them out. And you would take these tubules out. And this is the kind of tissue which you would take out for sperms. Now, this is the way you probably would find at times sperms in the tissue, which is, is a very good sample. This actually is just like an obstructive vasospermia sample of the testes. So you can see one sperm jumping around. So this is the sperm which you would normally get hold of. Oh my God, I have so many questions. There are so many questions. And uh, are the people from Bharasiram here? If they are here, my friends, I have about 10 minutes more. And there are a lot of questions. I'll try to answer all the questions. Now, this is how the sperms would be. So I'll just show you a PISA sample. So over here, what normally would be done, you would look for a sperm. This is a, I think a 12 or a 14 year old video. Yeah, and this is a reason which has been shot in 360. And today we do it in 4K or 1080. So I'm sorry about the quality, but this is a very old video which I have. I hope you can see it. Yes, here. So now we've got the sperm. Point to the egg. Puncture the egg. My God, see the problem with an antivirus is the antivirus at times becomes the virus. So I was coming on to this while the antivirus told me that it's time I stopped. So I'm here and to the end of the program. So this was what I wanted to tell you as a nutshell. I can take a series of eight different lectures and even they would be incomplete. But this was an overview which I wanted to give to you for you to add value to your patients. Patience and have patience to give babies to your patients. And I realize 
that we have such a large number of people who have joined this webinar. And can you imagine? All of them are here, even at the end of one hour, 15 minutes. And I just love it. And I just appreciate all of you to be here. And I love you all. So now I'm going to go ahead. And uh, of course, before that, I'll let you know. You can follow me on Instagram if you have Instagram. And if you have Instagram, follow me on Dr. Sunil K. Jindal. At the day, Dr. Sunil K. Jindal. Go to my bio after you followed me. There is a link over there. Open the link. And I have two PDFs of yours for you. One of ASRM for azuspermic men. And the second is of European Urological Association, which is a whole handbook, which I want to present to you and give it to you so that you could use it as a guideline to treat your patients. So please go on to Dr. Sunil K. Jindal. It's over here on Instagram. Go into the link in my bio. I mean, the moment you follow, you'll go to my bio. The moment you go into bio, there'll be a link. Click on the link. You'll get both the PDFs. Print those PDFs. Keep it in your clinic for future reference. They are very useful. That's what I want to bring to you at this moment. But you'll get it in my bio and just go ahead with it. Have all of you noted down the bio? At the rate, Dr. Sunil K. Jindal is my Instagram. Have you noted it down? Great. A few of you would say that you don't have an Instagram. The advantage of the Instagram is that on the Instagram, I normally do also go live to answer questions of people. And I also do one more thing. Always tell them about the next place where I'll be speaking. So that in case there is something missed out, I probably might be speaking about Jesus Pamics in the future. Probably I have next week I have uh, for Jesus Pamia. So you could also come over there where some doubts would be clarified. So this is where you would get me. And great. So now let me start answering questions. Is Mr. Session there? Mr. Session? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Yes. Hi, sir. Mr. Session? Yes, sir. Okay. I can hear you. Can Mr. You Session? Me? I can hear you, sir. Yeah, great. You can hear me? Uh, yes. Was the, was the lecture clearly audible? Everything was audible well? Yes, sir. Very much, very much. So if you could uh, kindly proceed to the questions. And we have also added a poll from the audience side to actually get a I feedback from them. So this will come to the right hand side of their viewing screens. Yeah, if they could kindly do this, it'd be great. Meanwhile, we can proceed with the questions. Great. So we have about 500 people over here with a lot of questions. I would like you guys to just type it on BIO again. Bring it on because we have fantastic questions. And I'd like to answer every question of yours. Okay. Right. So first of all is... Do antioxidants have a role? This is a question answered by, asked by Anindri. Anindri, antioxidants till some time back it was thought about, eight years back it was thought that they are placebos. But now one thing is clear, without doubt, antioxidants form a very important part of treatment in every patient of male infertility who has some kind of infertility infection or DNA fragmentation or increased ROS. So antioxidants are to be used. You use antioxidants normally for at least three months. In case there is a lecture which is organized on medical treatment, I could tell you in detail how to give antioxidants to your patients. Now the next question is, how do you manage severe immotile sperms by Julius Mena? Julius, say a hi first in the chat box. Yes, I need a hi from you in the chat box. Great. So now, Julius, please understand. If they are immotile sperms, the first thing which you have to see is, are they viable or not? All immotile, immotile sperms need not be dead. Now, in case you get 
them as viable or a few of them viable. It could be a syndrome which is known as immotile cilia syndrome or cartilaginous syndrome. In these cases, ICSI is the answer after doing HOS. And I have a very large series personally of these patients with videos of all these patients. In fact, if I tell you the story of a guy, it's very interesting. It happened, uh, I think, three months back. There's this gentleman who came to me. He was referred to me by, sent to me by a very respected teacher of ours, Dr. Meera Agnihotri from Kanpur. And he came to me from Kanpur. He had complete immotile sperms, tested him twice, immotile, did a viability test. Most of them were non-viable. I gave him antioxidants for four months. After four months, did it again. I got viable sperms, did an ICSI, and did an ICSI with a fresh sample, not a frozen sample, and went ahead and got viable sperms. So this is the beauty about ICSI. Now the second thing is, in case they're all non-viable or necrospermia, you can go ahead and do a TISA. Because at times, you get viable sperms in the testes and not in the semen. And you could go ahead and do an ICSI with these sperms. This is the second possibility. Now, the next question is, what is the correct way of using clomiphene in men with oligospermia? Dr. Bayer. Dr. Bayer, give me a hi in the chat box. Yeah, I need your hi. Wow, great. So, Dr. Bayer, Clomiphene needs to be used, as I've said, not in every patient. In a patient with low testosterone, normally we give 25 milligram of clomiphene, and we could give this continuously for a period of 25, uh, three months. When I give clomiphene, I normally also do a DNA fragmentation because there are oligospermic patients. In case the oligo DNA fragmentation is high, I could add, I could add, in these patients, in case it is high, I could add an antioxidant with it. So that's the way you normally would do. Otherwise, there is a long list of methodologies by which I could give clomiphene, which probably in case I do a lecture on medical management, and if you join, you would be able to know from there. Right. I think it's answered your question and a lot of questions which people have. Now, the next question is, sir, in case of azuspermic with a high LHFSH, what should be the next investigation, FNAC of the testes or else, what to offer to the couple? Manish Jain. Manish, give me a high or wave your hand. And please also type in ID. I do want to know, all those who want to know this. Just type in ID, ID in the chat box. Yes, I want it in the chat box, ID. Right, so I'll answer this question for everybody. If the FSH and LH are high, it does not mean that the man does not have testes, the sperms in his testes. They could be focal. They could be focal spermatogenesis. Like I'll show you on this paper, Can I have a paper, please? See, you need to understand one small thing. That in obstructive is in non-obstructive is uspermia. You can have a sample like a testes like this, where these small areas which are round could have focal spermatogenesis. So if the FSH and LH are high, a FNAC does not help. What helps in these patients is, if the testis is small in size, to go ahead and plan a micro TC. And before a micro TC, go ahead and do a needle biopsy, a multiple TEFN. So that is what I follow. I get a lot of patients who 
have high FSH and LH and given birth to so many of these people, so many of them. Wow. Wow. So I have from here, I have from Philippines, Ivy. Wow. So we have so many people from different places. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. So I have another question. Now, this question is, when to go for ROS and Y chromosome testing? Okay. ROS you would do where you feel that the patient has infection, where the patient is exposed to toxins, where you feel that the, even with, though the number is fine, patient is not getting pregnant, unexplained infertility, where the woman is absolutely fine and the sperm count is fine still, they're not getting pregnant, and ROS will let us know if the ROS level is high. Or you could get to a DNA fragmentation in these patients if there have been recurrent abortions, or an unexplained infertility. Now, Y chromosome microdeletion is done in nasospermics. That's a whole new chapter, which in nasospermia I would cover because it would take a lot of time and I have so many questions. Now, this was asked by me by Dr. Raja. Dr. Raja, hi, are you still there? Are you still there? But most of the questions are such that they are there by which I could answer to so many different people and they would clear your doubts. So now, next is how to do a PCT. This is something which was very routinely done earlier. So it's very simple. Post intercourse, you call the wife and you take out from the cervix, the cervical mucus. In the cervical mucus, you check the number of these sperms and the motility of these sperms. Today, it is a beautiful indicator that sexual intercourse has taken place. Earlier, it used to be felt that if they're immotile, there is antibodies. Even if they're antibodies, normally ART is the answer for anti-sperm antibodies. So this was asked to me by Dr. Sutha. Jyoti. Now the next is at which sperm count should we start treating the male partner if no associated asthino or teratol zoos per me? Dr. Sonal Shroff. You know Dr. Sonal, please type in hi because you've asked such a fantastic question which I want to answer to everybody. Every patient of infertility who comes to you should come with your husband, with the no, patient's husband, should come with the patient's husband. And the patient's husband, his history needs to be taken. Every patient. So when do you start treating? Any couple who doesn't have a child after one year of cohabitation, the husband and wife both need to be checked. And a semen analysis needs to be always done for the male part. I'm sure I've answered your question and I've given this very important message to everybody. Next is, is there some criteria like if largest diameter of dilated vein more than 3 mm on ultrasound is very good me? Ultrasound is not the best investigation for varicose. Examination is the best investigation for varicose. You do not operate a subclinical varicose. You operate a varicose when it's clinically palpable. One, the female partner is about normal. The semen analysis has some problem in it and the couple is infertile. Right? As far as detecting is concerned, if there is anything more than two centimeters, it would be considered to be a situation where you would diagnose varicoses. But more than that, you would normally see if there is a reversal and flow on Valsalva maneuver in the ultrasound. Now, next is. Is 
Dr. Ritu Punhani. Dr. Ritu, are you there? Give me a hi. Okay. So, Dr. Ritu's question is, 30-year-old male, semen analysis shows azospermia, two semen analysis, bilateral test is small, FSH 26, testosterone 223, karyotyping awaited, how to proceed, non-obstructive azospermia, if the karyotyping is fine, please go ahead for a micro TSA or a TCA in this patient. You have to counsel this patient before that. While counseling the patient, you have to explain to him that ideally in a non-obstructive azospermia, the best way to do a TSA or a micro TSA is at the time of an ART cycle. Because in case the sperms which we get are very low, then post-freezing, the retrieval of them can be less. Therefore, it is always best fresh. And you also have to take consent that in case sperms are not found, would you have to cancel the cycle or they will they agree for a donor sperm? So this is what you will have to do in this patient. But the most important thing is, and I say this to all of you, we are clinicians and we are few of those people who are the most hardworking and intelligent people who put all their lives for patients. Please say no to third party reproduction. Even if a woman has a high AMH, in HC you could get her eggs. Give her a try. Because we've been doing this work for the last 18 years. And let me tell you one thing. The joy and the pleasure of your own babies is phenomenal with these people. And more important, in case these people have a donor egg, a very large number of them, or a donor sperm, sperm more importantly, a large number of them later on have psychological issues. Please keep this in mind. Now, next is FSH LH value to diagnose hypo hypo. Hypo hypo is diagnosed by low FSH, low LH, low testosterone, small testes. Man looks like a woman. He doesn't have any mustaches. His chest does not have hair. Pubic hair are less. And my God, the moment you see, you diagnose. Any role of empirical antibiotic therapy, no milin, it is not there. You would only give if you need to give antibiotic. Now, how much, how do you diagnose DNA fragmentation by semen analysis? Shizara Okeke, semen analysis does not diagnose DNA fragmentation. You have to test for DNA fragmentation to know DNA fragmentation. Best Antioxidant combination available in the market, dose of SCG, HMG for hypo, hypo. Dr. Shoba, there is nothing like the best. You need to understand two things. Number one, antioxidants need to be given judiciously and you need to keep in mind the pocket of the patient. Antioxidants particularly will not increase the number of these sperms. If they are too expensive, it hurts the patient. So the cheaper they are, they could be better for you. The dose of SCG, HMG, this is uh, age, size of testes, and weight dependent. Normally, it would be 2,000 international units SCG three times a week, and 75 to 150, two to three times a week of HMG. But this needs to uh, be tabulated, cannulated. There's no single dose for it. In multiple biopsies, how many incisions we give on both the testes? Ritu. You normally give 8 to 16. Either 4 and 4 above and below the equator or 8 and 8 above and below the equator. Now, 
there are some feedback questions in the poll i would request you to give a feedback because there are too many important questions and beautiful questions which are there though we are crossing one and a half hours do you know the last time i had this program we went on for 3 hours 20 minutes 3 hours 20 minutes and the best is towards the end people increased because probably people called their friends and said there are a lot of questions being answered they could pertain to you you know what whenever somebody asks a question and i am in the audience i always listen because it may be useful to me and uh, that's something which is very very useful in question and answers now next is what up to what percentage of cases with azoospermia with high fsh can you get sperms by tisa if it fails what are the options jai ram i'll answer this question but feedback questions as a poll please answer them please answer them please answer them feedback who all have answered yes in case you have in case you have please chat in i please chat in i great so now the question is in case fsh is high it depends on what is the problem there can be three problems hypospermatogenesis maturation arrest maturation arrest and sertoli only syndrome in hypospermatogenesis retrieval by micro t cell see please understand two things now everybody does not have the same retrieval because you don't have embryologist who can sit for 2 hours and say i will call it a day only when i get sperms most of the people who get embryologist from outside are least interested it's nothing to be i'm saying it because i really mean it and what is done is in 5 or 10 minutes they say sperms are not there so in case there is a micro t cell done and the embryologist works very well in hypospermatogenesis 60% to 65% of the cases you get sperms in case there is maturation arrest consider the figure around 30% maybe 40% too but if you consider satori only it could be around 10 to 15% so you're giving babies to people who have been declared by everybody else as not being able to have children and therefore it is most important to use this right now the next question is very often we fail in giving sperms what are the other alternatives see you have to first diagnose what is the problem if it is an obstructive azoospermia you should be capable of getting sperms in over 90% i get sperms in more than 95% first second in case it is non obstructive azoospermia and you doing a single biopsy that's not the answer either do a tefna with multiple biopsies or do a micro t cell if you have done that then you are sure you have not got sperms now in these patients you have to be very very clear before itself if they ask for a donor sperm if they don't ask for a donor sperm and you have done in the same cycle you could freeze the eggs and give the alternative to the patient that well you could wait plan we have frozen your eggs this is one alternative or for patients who say that we will not use donor eggs in non obstructive azoospermia you could do a micro t cell in the minus 1 cycle so that you show whether sperms are there or not if they are there you do any cell uh, you do a stimulation if they are not there don't do a stimulation and please do not move them towards donation just give them a 
true, clear picture. Now, next is Dr. Nina Gupta, case of OATS with all normal hormones, should chromosomal analysis required? Dr. Nina, the criteria for a chromosomal analysis is very clear. If the sperm count is less than 5 million, you could go ahead, or isospermia, you could go ahead for a chromosomal analysis. What is the cause of black sediment in semen sample after centrifugation also causing transparent genitalious material in semen sample, Dr. Kashish Patankar, Patnikar. Dr. Kashish, I don't exactly understand what you mean over here as a black sediment. The two things which you need to understand clearly are, the most important thing is the collection of the semen. It should be done without any contaminants. It should be done after the penis has been washed with saline. It should be done after the hands have been washed properly and there should be no contamination at the time when ejaculation has to take place. First, in case there is transparent gelatinous material, I have again not got it right what you mean, but in case the viscosity is high, you could do two things, pass the semen within a syringe to liquefy it or place the beaker with media already because liquefaction and gelatinization, if that is what you mean, takes place only once the semen is out. If you place it in a beaker, which already has media in it, it does not get agglutinated. How do you diagnose retrograde ejaculation? Keg, Zar, Lin. After the man has had intercourse, ask him to pass urine. Check the urine. If the urine has sperms, what is it? Please type in. Yeah, please type in. What is it? R-E. R-E. R-E, which means retrograde ejaculation. How important is DFI and how to treat high DFI? Very important in repeated pregnancy loss, unexplained infertility, failed IUI cycles, failed IVF cycles. Smokers, varicoses, infections, gonadotoxins. How do you treat it? You treat it by antioxidants. You treat it by removing infections. You treat it by operating on varicoceles. You treat it by giving at times clomiphene, especially in oligospermics, as an adjuvant to antioxidants. What is the dose? This was Dr. Shilpa. Yeah. Dr. Shilpa, are you there? Are you still there? Mr. Session, I can't see the chat box. So I would like to know as people, how many people are there at the moment with this in my box? Look, wow. So all the people are staying till the end. Great. Have all of you noted down my Instagram at the rate Dr. Sunil K. Jindal. Have all of you noted it down? Have all of you noted it down? If you have not, please note it down. Go follow me. I have one program on azospermia, which I am going to have next week. It's going to be there on my Instagram. You could from my Instagram. Hook on because I'll put the link over there. Whoever organizes it, you will be there. This I'm clear about because I just love you. Great. So just go on there. In the bio, I have placed two PDFs. European U Urological Association Guidelines. It's a booklet which is the simplest for you to understand for all of you to start treating. And number two, Azuspermia, ASRM guidelines. There are two booklets. Just get them from there. So just go on to there. Follow me. Go on to my bio and you're going to get it there. Right. So the next question is uh, dose schedule of SCG HMG. I just told you probably in the medical lecture you would come to know because I explained Dr. Mayud Kumar Chakraborty. Hi. I'll do it in the next lecture. 
Sir, could you enumerate on the occupational hazards of sperm parameters? You know, I took a lecture on this in Calcutta, which was a 45 minute lecture where I came up with the different occupations which have hazards. But in a nutshell, everything around us is a toxin. Most of them are gonadotoxins. Sperm is the most sensitive thing you could get. And you need to understand anybody close to chemicals, anybody close to heat, anybody close to mobile towers, radiation, anybody close to infection, and a lot of drugs and food which is contaminated with estrogens, phytoestrogens, all this leads to a low sperm count. In fact, last night it was interesting. I'm a meat eater. My wife, Sajan, she showed me a program on Netflix. And that said, men who eat meat have a low sperm count. So it's crazy. I ultimately feel there's so many things in the world which lead to a low sperm count. But yes, hazards all around are phenomenal. And this was asked to me by Dr. Shanti. Dr. Shanti. Yeah, hi. Now next is, suppose you get immature sperms in TISA, how do you proceed? Look for new sperms. Do the best to get a mature sperm. Do the best to get morphological normal sperms. If I don't get anything, I just have them. Eggs are there in front of me. I go ahead and do a TISA. A lot of times I get fantastic embryos with this. So please understand. It's the man behind the machine, not the machine. It's the man who wants to love their patients to do the work. It's fantastic. But even if you have immature sperms, look for more. If you don't get them, use them for TISA. Uh, for ICSI. Is folic acid has a role in male infertility? Anna make canna Kegelban, Anna, yes, it's a good antioxidant. It is a good antioxidant. In obstructive azuspermia, Mr. Session, do I have do I have time further? Can yes, I sir, please proceed. Please Achha, proceed, can, sir. In case I can, I. I li like to ask the audience, shall I answer more questions? Though I have a few questions which are extremely interesting. Should I answer them? If you want me to answer them, please type on, bring it on, B-I-O, B-I-O. B-I-O in the chat box. B-I-O in the chat box. My God, people are still answering questions. Wow. Wow. I'll have some water. Cheers. You know, the beauty about a webinar is what? You can connect to so many people. Everybody is in the comfort of their homes. Nobody has traveled. I have not traveled to Chennai. People have not traveled to Chennai to listen to a lecture. You're sitting in your home. And I can really talk to all of you and be in connection with you to give you something which is left over here in your next lecture. How? By going, but you'll have to hook on to me. I won't be able to hook on to you. This you need to understand, which you could do by going on to the bio and following me. Now, the next question which is here is, in obstructive azuspermia, what is the preferred method of sperm retrieval in view of the high ROS activity in the epidemic? Dr. Abhishek Parihar. Abhishek, hi. Nice to have you here. It's a very good question you asked. But please understand one small thing. Obstructive azuspermia. In case the epididymis is thick and good, the best method to get is MISA. Microsurgical epididymal aspiration. Why? Because you get a big quantity you can open the epididymis and close it back. You do not move the integrity of the epididymis out. And in case you need future sperms, the retrieval and the harvest is very good. But otherwise, a simpler procedure, less expensive, is PISA. Now the question is whether I should go ahead and do 
a TISA for this because probably this sperm will have less ROS. Give this patient antioxidant for three months. And my friend, don't put a knife on the testes. No man wants a knife on the testes. Right? Since an obstructive is spermia, you can get sperms very well. Next is, do you recommend PRP as management for azoospermic men, Dr. Amar Muhammad Qasim from Iraq? No. No. I, you know, PRP has become something which you inject into bloody anything in life. I don't have hair. Somebody told me put in PRP. If you don't have an erection, it is useful at times. It is useful at times in the endometrium. But for sperms, there is no, not a single piece of literature. By literature, I mean a trial, a proper trial, which suggests PRP is useful. For varicocele, which surgical procedure will be of choice with better results, open or laparoscopic? Dr. Sham Kumar. Hi, Sham. How are you? Hi. Just type in a hi to me. Yeah. The only procedure to be done for fertility with varicocele is a microsurgical varicocele. Laparoscopic is not good. Microsurgical, why? Because the spermatic artery, which is very thin, goes along. In most of the other naked eye procedures, you tie the spermatic artery and the patient becomes even more hypospermic and the testes become even smaller. So what you actually need is to go ahead and do a microsurgical varicoselectomy. In which males should you check for estrogen levels? Dr. Ritu. Dr. Ritu, are you there? If you are there, give me a hi. Good. You asked a good question. As it is, you know, there are bad answers. There are no bad questions. So, I'll give you a good answer for that. Fat men. Men who have, who are obese, these are the men in whom the chances of having estrogen are going to be high. You do an E2 in these people or you do it in E2 in people who's estro who are slightly obese, who have gynecomasia and you can make it out that they have some kind of a female habitus and the testosterone is down. Do an E2 in them. If LH, FSH are normal or borderline, testosterone, what should testosterone, borderline testosterone, what should be the treatment? If LH, FSH are low, see the testicular size. If the testicular size is less, you would give these patients hormones. It could be hypogonotrophic hypogonotism. Good evening, sir. FSH is low. FSH is normal. I had a sperm count previously 36 million. Done IUI, but IUI count is only 8 million. I have done IUI. How to proceed further? I cannot get the question clearly. But one thing for us to understand very simply is, you know, you know what you guys are doing? The answer to this is so long because sperm optimization for IUI is a whole lecture. When will IUI give you pregnancy? With what sperms? With what count? With what motility? With what total motile sperm count? With what inseminate sperm volume? These All these things need to be explained in about 20 minutes, which I don't have. But please keep in mind, mota mota. In case there is a patient who has a low sperm count, these are the counts, patients who have the lowest possibility of pregnancy with IUI. In case the count is 36 million, it's fine. But if the count is only 8 million, well, there are chances that you will not get a pregnancy with IUI. Oh. <clears throat> Can we free sperms retrieved from TISA? Dr. Anu Agrawal. Anu, say, give me a high. Give me a high. I'll have some water. Give me a high. Thank you. 
yes yes you can freeze sperms from a single tissa and do up to four ixis i have personally done up to three cycles of ixi with a single retrieval and i'm talking of a sperm retrieval from the testes i'm not talking of retrieval from the pisa or misa in misa you get so many sperms my goodness you could open a bank for them in obstructive ways by misa so in tisa you free sperms yes role of proveronum in treatment option of male infertility dr hamid akela baby dr hamid give me a hi where are you from dr hamid please type in you know what i love the fact that we have 500 people from all over the world 550 yes from all over the world why because of the web and the internet we would never have been there together i sitting in my lobby with water you sitting in your chairs lying down on your sofas on your rocking chairs with iphones with laptops with your child with you somebody with their faces on somebody with everything i mean you are so comfortable and i am so comfortable and i can go ahead and meet people from all over the world and talk to them and add value to their lives and their patients lives i love it i just love it and that's the reason why this question is most important doctor amit you do not give testosterone to any man who is infertile because his sperm count does not increase by testosterone so you do not give the patient proveronum you do not give the patient testosterone undecanoate you only give testosterone in patients who are hypogonadotrophic and who have testosterone deficiency even there you prefer testosterone gel as the treatment option dr hamid is from iraq wow so i just got it great dr hamid now the next question is a male with normal hormones but low volume with low sperm count how to proceed dr raja dr raja i in a book nutshell had given you so many things go into the pdf you will get the answers and in case you don't get the answers follow me on instagram go to my bio the next program i would have on medical management i'll answer your question there so many questions which were there so many questions which still are left there are so many people who are still with me i just love you all and thank you very much for being here but i'd also say something how many of you have not been able to go on to instagram and join me how many of you how many how many have not been able to follow me in case you have not been able to follow me because you are not on instagram i will just type in a number i'll just type in a number it's 80666085 just type in this number this is the number of my secretary please do one thing send a whatsapp save this number save this number this is my second number which is there in my office save this number in your phone save this number as my number and put in put in your id your whatsapp id so that it could be saved and a broadcast list i will create and send you a lot of things with that yes just type in this number and whatsapp your name and your number onto this number 
but save this number if you have not saved this number the broadcast will not reach you and on the broadcast i will send you the two journals and along with that the further programs so this is the way i stay connected with you people to hand over to you a few more things because remember the michael jordan story first you have to add value to yourself to add value to other people that's what i believe in and that's what i feel is fantastic thank you very much and uh, love you all and would probably see you in the next program in where i am in case you are following me good evening thank you very much mr sundaram mr seshan yes sir i can hear you are you still there yes sir i am still there very much there great i <clears throat> actually have a chat box where i'm not sure can you just say share this number on the main have, for everybody i just shown it as a slide to everybody on ppt so they can actually see it if you want i can do Achha, it again I, yeah do it again i can't yes. see it can you see yeah. this now yes i can see it now so, so just put in this number once you have put in this number save it once you have saved this number just put in your contact to this whatsapp number and i will broadcast to you in case you can't follow on instagram but instagram is much better much better than this because one may forget otherwise mr session i think it's been a fantastic uh, program which we've had fantastic sir wonderful actually beautiful there a lot of positive comments and everyone is just wanting more and more the questions are still pouring in <laughs> you, you know something the last program which i had was a program where the program went on for 2 uh, uh, hours 48 minutes because i have the recording of that wow. and and the 2 hour 48 minute program just did not break and more people came in to the end which i loved because it means they're calling their friends come over it's something ek aadmi ye theek kar raha hoga shayad so i love that way it was great it was fantastic so do we still have people with us yes sir we still have people uh, looking I, in actually yes and uh, mrs yes so mrs session can can i say a goodbye to all of uh, the people in the audience Yes, and could, could could i could i have you and the support team of bharat serum with me for a debrief please uh sure sir i will do that we can connect later if possible currently the recording is live it's on okay fine great so thank you very much namaskar it's been a pleasure to be here with everybody thank you all of you for being here and sheshan you have been a great conductor of everything thank you very much here